How will COVID-19 shape our economic future? The IMF estimates the global cost of the virus at 28 trillion US dollars in lost output. That's between 2020 and 2025. But we've heard a lot about how damaging the pandemic has been for the economy and people's livelihoods. Still, there may be some changes for the better. Economists hope the environment, local industry, and even our social lives could eventually benefit from the experience. Hello and welcome to your COVID-19 special. I'm Chris Colbert in Berlin. There's so much that we needed to learn about the coronavirus, that we needed to adapt to during the pandemic. And still, the cost of it has been overwhelming. When it all started, DW's Ben Fazulin talked to five top economists about their predictions for the business world and our working lives. A year on, he spoke to them again in the hope of garnering a little more hope. I think you should be confident, not over optimistic, but confident. This is one of the most severe crises in, in the world history we ever had. But on the other hand, of course, we see also very positive things of, let's say, people sitting in the same boat. No, I don't think we have learned enough. I think we're still stumbling our way forward. So we have amateur drivers at the, at the wheels of the global economy, and, and that's the main danger we face. The pandemic uh, has increased cooperation in society. There has been a lot of cooperation across countries. It's a big source. Uh, of, of innovation. Where we do need to go now is a more inspiring collective future vision of what we want our economies to look like. And this is the moment to do it. April 2020 was grim. Where is everyone? Now there's light at the end of the tunnel. There's a vaccine. We have a strong instrument in our hands to fight this pandemic. A year ago, it wasn't clear we would have that. A year ago, economists were trying to predict what sort of a recession was coming. A V signifies a sharp, brief decline followed by a rebound. W is a double dip recession. L is a plunge that stays down low for a long time. It was nothing like an L-shaped recession, uh, fortunately. We would have been far, far worse without that level of government spending. It was between a V-shaped recession and something maybe like a W. It was an up and down, a roller coaster situation. But at the very end, I'm quite confident that uh, we are now really on the upward trend. It depends who we refers to. What has become very clear is that we're looking at a K-shaped recovery. A continued polarization, a hollowing out of the middle class, um, the uh, a concentration of workers in low-skilled, low-paid jobs, and then a concentration of workers in high-skilled, high-paid jobs. The pandemic was a major dis equalizer. I think that is uh, probably the key issue between rich and poor after the crisis, that this trend is really accelerating. But what about the record amounts of money governments are spending to rebuild economies? This is only going to maintain a status quo that already wasn't working. We will see more home office, uh, more more working from home, and, and uh, that means more options for highly trained and highly educated workers. We've also seen a push in digitization and acceleration. Again, this favors highly educated people. And now, post the pullback of some of these support measures, you can probably expect that for those that were already having a difficult time, things will get worse. There has definitely been a, a wealth transfer again to the wealthy. And like every, everything that happens in, in the Western economy, the solution is to make it better by making the wealthy wealthier. Um, I, I, there has to be a day of reckoning for that at some stage, I hope. A year ago, economist Daniel Stetter told me just throwing money at the problem wouldn't work. Our strategy of the past 30 years of solving all problems in the economy by having cheaper money and more credit and more loans is coming to an end. It didn't. Governments have never spent so much. But Daniel's still not a fan. What has been the main driver of inequality in the past 40 years? Easy credit. Much more money which was created 
lower interest rates, and whenever there was a crisis, instead of having the rich lose money, the central bank stepping in. So they should really rather do their job and get the financial system back to the original role of funding productive investments and not speculation. So if you speculate and you make a mistake, you should lose your money and you should not be rescued. Is there something positive that's come out of all of this where you see, okay, the world's woken up to this or, or politicians finally understand economics? Well, I'm, well, no, uh, uh, politicians never understand economics. I doubt it, to be honest. I see a big risk that politicians now have the belief that they are the ones managing the world. And um, I think they have not done a good job in the corona uh, crisis. I fear it's going to be to lead to less efficient and effective solutions. And therefore, I would say it's an excuse for politicians to grasp more power. Getting bolder is going to pay off in the longer term because this is the moment to create the care economy, to upgrade our education systems, to put in place lifelong learning systems, to put in place self-sustaining better social safety nets for the future. All of that happens now. And what about globalization? The pandemic brought international trade to a screeching halt. The main change over time, I hope, will be more localization of manufacturing. I think that we've got far too lengthy supply chains, far too much based on exploiting cheap wages in the rest of the world and not developing the domestic economy where the consumption actually occurs. I do not think that globalization will be replaced by regionalization or localization. We shouldn't forget that locally concentrated production also has its risks. Uh, so what we are heading for, I believe, is less concentration, let's say, on the cheapest supplier, but more diversification to be more resilient uh, in future crises. But this may even lead to more rather than less globalization. I'm very skeptical, for, for instance, about supply, supply chain laws, because they split labor markets in poor countries, trapped in commodities. Uh, it's not good that developing countries, poorer countries, will always be commodity exporters. Uh, that's, that's not the way to development, to prosperity. The crisis gave us all pause for thought. It gave the environment a break too, but not for long. Well, wherever this virus came from, even if it came from the Wuhan lab, um, the ultimate cause of this crisis has been excessive human pressure upon the biosphere. And we're going to see more and more instances of that coming back. So the light at the tunnel may be the fire uh, of, the, of the forest burning ahead of you, bringing your factories down. All of us have seen one dire warning after another that talks about um, how, how far we have pushed to the limit the planet and how our current economic systems are not compatible with having a more sustainable and greener economy. Uh, we have to change our consumption habits, we'll do that, and maybe we'll be more social interconnection and maybe also social, let's say, coherence when we had it before. It has also shown us that maybe we can travel a little less, do more things from home, uh, be, and, and that alone would be more environmentally friendly. But um, uh, of course, on balance, you know, it would be better to if the next pandemic didn't come before, let's say, 100 years. Or maybe even much later than that, because tackling the calamities at hand seems to be difficult enough. For example, when it comes to having the right jab to fight the coronavirus. Here's our science correspondent, Derek Williams, answering your questions. Why is authorization for the Chinese and Russian vaccines being delayed by Europe's medical regulator? Under ordinary circumstances, so, so when we're not smack dab in the middle of the largest global health crisis in a century, um, it takes quite a while for the EMA or, or the European Medicines Agency to carry out scientific evaluations after phase three trials uh, with therapies and vaccines, generally between nine and 10 months. Uh, but that's under ordinary circumstances. Uh, in the midst of the pandemic, the EMA set up a special task force to help fast track 
COVID-19 vaccines. Um, a key change is that developers don't have to wait until all of their data is final before submitting it for approval, but have been able to submit it instead in batches while, while trials are still ongoing, a, a process called rolling review. Uh, both Chinese and Russian vaccines are now in this rolling review process in the EU, but the agency hasn't made any promises on when exactly market authorization will be forthcoming, um, if it does. I'd say there's no question that politics has played at least a secondary role in delaying this process, but, but that's far from the only reason it's taking so long. There have also been issues with trial data. Uh, for some time, the EMA said the data being presented by Chinese and Russian developers um, didn't meet EU standards for proof of effectiveness, of safety, and quality. Uh, the agency, as a rule, is pretty tight-lipped about the review process. Um, a, a Chinese vaccine has been in it since the beginning of May and, and Russia's Sputnik V since March. But it's still impossible to say anything firm about when exactly EMA authorization might be granted, um, though many other countries around the world are already using the vaccines. Um, it could take another month or two in the EU, or it could take a lot longer. And that wraps up our show. For more, you can always hit our website at dw.com slash COVID-19. For now, thanks for watching. Stay safe.